Welcome, Your Highness. Um, it's been a pleasure to host you tonight. Um, starting tonight's questions, I thought maybe it might be nice for you to give a little remark, a uh, little speech that you probably have prepared. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings to everyone. It's a, quite a pleasure for me to be here, but also such an honor because basically I'm seated here, or I should say I'm standing on the shoulders of so many great people and great speakers that have come here before me. So my uh, presence here is a testimony that there is something I'm doing that I'm doing pretty okay. <laughs> so I have not prepared any, any speech because I, I tend to not do that. Um, I think for me, it's important to just sense and feel the room and then just speak from my heart. Uh, because I have vowed that I will only be a tool. Uh, so I try to keep my ego out of the way and then prepare stuff. It's like, oh, are, are they going to like this? And then they're going to like that. Maybe they're going to laugh here. Maybe they're going to applaud here. So I'm, I leave that to people who are highly proficient in doing so. And I'm just going to speak from my heart. So the important thing that I have to do because of my tradition is that I have to state my name and my status and sometimes my name is a bit complicated, so it cannot be pronounced properly, and it's okay, but because I have to honor my people and those who have put this crown upon me, and for those lineage who have bestowed me this power, I have to state their name, because we believe in ancestor reverence, so be always um, uh, thankful and grateful for all those who have come before us that have made it so that we can manifest today. So my name is Queen Diambi Kabatuswila Chiyoyomwata Mukalenga Mukaji Wankashama Wabakwaluntu Wabaluba Wakasai Wakongo. So this means, my name is Diambi. Diambi means the bearer of good news in my, in my language, the one who tells beautiful story, meaning that my is kind of like my mission statement encased in a word, saying that everywhere you go, make sure that you leave with people happier than you found them, at least with a smile on their face or with hope. So this is really what my name means. Kabatuswila is my father, meaning really keep your eyes open because you can never take things for granted. You always make sure that you are alert. Chiyoyomwata is the lineage I come from, is my great grandfather who was the king Chiyoyomwata. Mukalinga Mukajiwan Kashama means I'm the female king of the order of the leopard. So it's quite awkward. People say, why would you say female king and what just queen or seated queen or ruler queen? Or um, It's very important and I will explain a bit later why female king is important. And I am of the order of the leopard. For those who don't know, the order of the leopard is one of the most ancient order that exists in the world. Um, we used to initiate also the pharaohs of Kemet. Uh, that the, Greece, the Greeks have called Egypt later on. So we have a very tight relationship with all the school of thoughts of Africa. So the leopard is my totem animal. So the Luntu people are people in Kasai, in the region of Kasai, but they are also in Congo, in Angola, in, and in Zambia, because after 1805, um, they created all these new countries that we know today as being Africa which is fairly new and inefficient. However, we are there now, and my tribe is split between three countries. So we have Congo, the Luntu in Congo. We have the Luntus of Angola. Now they speak Portuguese. We speak French. Then we have the Luntus of Zambia, who speaks now English because the ex-former colonies split all these countries. So, and I belong to a greater group that's called the Luba. I'm sure if you put Luba, you will learn a lot about a very, very big uh, ethnic group in Congo and in Africa in general, because even the Zulus of South Africa are descendants of Luba. So they are a Luba group that immigrated south and populated, you know, the southern region of Africa. So that's for my first, my name and my first quality. However, I am also grande mai do povo banto brasileiro. So I am great mother of the African descendants of Brazil. So it could be quite you know, awkward to say, but you are queen in Congo, why would you be also a queen mother or a great mother in, in Brazil? Well, we have a long relationship with uh, Brazil because uh, all the Africans who are in Brazil today or the African descendants who are in Brazil today came from, the, from, the, from Africa. And a lot of them came from the, Bas the Congo Basin. So many of them are, are most likely descendants of some of my people. And if not, they are descendants of the great continent of Africa. So for many, many centuries, we were separated um, you know, through the very brutal um, you know, um, events, catastrophic events in history that were human trafficking. So some of our people were taken for human trafficking, deported 
got put in uh, forced labor camp for generation after generation. They were in forced labor camp and then uh, were abused severely. So, and then despite the fact that, you know, slavery was abolished, they still have, are suffering the stigma of being, having been the victim. So they have been victimized twice because they've been a victim of being captured, captured, enslaved and so forth. But now they're the victim because they wear that uh, stigma of being a former or descendant of a slave, which I reminded them that they were not. They were descendant of enslaved people. So it's a difference when you say you're a slave because that's a noun and it's a qualifier as opposed to enslaved is is not is a is an adjective. So to to, to state your condition. So because I do a lot of work um, with those communities of the African diaspora in the world, um, because I believe that there is the time and place for reconciliation and restructuring of what it is to be an African in this world today. I am very much in those spaces where I want to know what's going on and I want to discover, as I was once a young student like yourself, most of you here, uh, I was a foreign student in America. So when I left uh, Africa and I lived in Europe, because I'm also of mixed heritage, so my mother is European, she's Belgian, and it's a long story, but in her DNA, she also have Brits and, and Irish and, and Vikings and all that. So I'm like, okay, I'm not as simple as what you think I could look like. Um, so I have my mother on one side who's Belgian, so she raised me with the standards of a Westerner. But I grew up in Africa because my father being an African, uh, we lived in Africa and I grew up there. So when I went to live in the United States as a student, uh, I'm a former student of uh, City University of New York, and I met with the African Americans who were looking at me thinking that maybe they will find answers about the ancestry and the Africans and so forth. And I realized that there was a massive gap of information because whatever I was giving them, it was really not what they were asked, they were looking for. And they were asking me, how is Africa? And I was like, Africa's like here. We have TV, we have Michael Jackson, we have this, we have, oh, have you seen a lion? And I was like, yes, of course I've seen a lion at the zoo. You know, so there was a disconnect between the fact that they were expecting some kind of mythical Africa uh, of which I couldn't speak of, of which I couldn't speak. So um, I started to realize that when I left my land, I was a Zarian or Congolese, but there was another step that I needed to do towards my own self and towards my own identity. So luckily I was in New York and the African community in America, they are very vibrant, the African descendants, and there was a, an immense body of information that I could access, which I didn't have in Europe or which I didn't have even in Africa. So I started to go to different major library like Schomburg Library in, in Harlem or access, go sp listen to, to you know, speak and realized that there was a whole story about Africa that I absolutely didn't know and I had no clue because even though I grew up in Africa, I didn't learn anything about Africa really. I learned about Africa from colonization and I learned that my ancestors were Romans and I learned about the Greeks and I learned about the Vikings and the, and, and the, 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 Brit, the Brits and but I hardly learned anything about Africa and what was Africa before. It seemed to us after we watched Tarzan and King Kong that basically before there was really nothing, just some savage running around. And, um, and then there were the European that came and poof came civilization, poof came everything, smart knowledge and all that. So, and then we were basically lucky to have been colonized because yeah, thanks to that we were now, and we entered into human history. Well, I found out that it was completely not the truth. So as much as I started to dig, I started to realize, oh my God, why didn't I know that before? Why wasn't I taught about me? So being also a mixed heritage, and I think that even if you're not uh, you're mixed like myself, European, African, you are still a European, even if you are black, because you are what we call assimilated. Because when they colonize, they say to us, since you were savage before, now that we have civilization, let go of everything that you ever knew before, and now you can maybe enter into the realm of humanity, if only you become a little bit more Western. So speak like us, dress like us, look like us, believe like us. So all the standards for, for success had to be compiled into an, uh, an African who looked modern, we say, but it's really an African who was washed out of his authenticity. So my father was one of those. He was born in 1942, and he was born in the midst of the colonization. 
So when he was 17, he was now uh, independent. But although the European um, were no longer you know, in power, in a visible position of power, the inst mental institutions, in the sense that the ideas, those institutions were still very present and still with all the terms and condition of uh, the treaties that were signed, the idea was that progressively Africa was going to move towards uh, the westernization of their nations so they could enter into the realm of the world's you know, nation, respectable world nation. So my father, just like many other students that probably came here and in other great institutions, they were about to come here to be shaped so they could go back home and then reshape and may, maybe bring, you know, uh, you know, steer Africa towards the direction of so-called, I put in quote, development. So those words are still circulating today. Those ideas are still circulating today. But when I started to look to find out who I was, why was I more knowledgeable of everything European about myself? I knew my family, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather. You know, I'm also from Luxembourg, by the way. So on that side. <laughs> so I knew all this information, but yet again on my father's side, I only knew my dad, I knew his brothers, and that was about it. So there was a massive deficit even in the way I qualify myself to be an African woman. Because although I'm mixed, when I walk around, even if I don't have all these um, traditional um, you know, uh, regalia, they look at me like an African woman. Nobody will ever say, oh, she's European. No, I'm, I may be mixed, but I'm still an African. And I claim that and I'm very proud of it. So being in the United States allowed me to dig and to start finding out treasures. I started to find out that no, the Kemetic civilization was not a civilization made by aliens from another planet or people that just vanished into the air. They were the ancestors of my father. They were African, Negroids, African. They were not any kind of people that came from somewhere else and then just vanished and left all the work they've done. Because not only we could see the body of work that they left behind, but we could trace the development of that civilization from further south all the way to the basin of Congo, the region of the Great Lakes, where my people are from. Not only that, but then the correspondence in terms of ideas, in terms of rituals, in terms of language. You know, I thought the pyramid was Cheops. Well, no, it's Kofu. I thought this lady was uh, Isis. Well, no. Is Aisa too? So all these things and this correspondence started to be sound so familiar to me. The hair, the hairstyles for the little girl before they were prepubescent girls of Kemet were the same hairstyle that we did in my village, in my land. So the correspondence was so blatant that you could not inscribe. Egypt or Kemet outside of an African experience. But not just to say, wow, we had Kemet, but to realize that before Kemet, there were other great civilization in Africa, all the way to Sudan. You find pyramids, actually. You actually find the first one there. So they, they, they did all kinds of modernization before they got to perfection that we can still see today. So then I find out that the Greeks themselves were not liars. They wrote about the experience going to Africa they told us that, hey, we're going to the land of the Negroes. We went there and we learned this, we learned this, we learned this, we learned this. But yet again, during Renaissance, some editing happened and then some information just dropped out of, you know, of, of existence, unless people eventually would go and dig deep and find out that the Greeks themselves said, we got this knowledge from there. And also, archaeology have also proven that when you talk about the theorem of Thales, or we talk about the theorem of Pythagore, well, it just happened that there are papyrus, or papyra, that are thousands of years older than the existence of these men. So how come with the same formulas, this exists before? So it's kind of like entering almost or breaking down like the walls of a matrix. And it's, the matrix is a matrix of kind of like lie. Um, but it's okay, because I understand it was propaganda for the time being, we needed to do something. The leaders of Europe, as leaders are supposed to do to look for the welfare of their own people, you know, thought that they had to do some social engineering and propaganda so that they could explain that they could do what they did. So 
I'm not here to put history on trial, but I'm here to say now it's a new day. So this new day, it's time that we recover our own identity because Africa and the history of Africa is not a separate history from the history of humanity. The history of Africa is the history of humanity and it belongs to all of you Africans in this room because I don't have to remind you that you are all Africans, do I? Because if you, know, you don't know, I will ask you to check your DNA. We have been around for 200,000 years ago, 200,000 years. Out of that 200,000 years, we spent about 130,000 only on the continent of Africa. So imagine that if you are a man who's 100 years old, when you leave your home, you are 70. You didn't leave a cradle. So Africa is no cradle. Africa was much more to us all. Africa is home, Africa is the university, Africa is the temple. And when we march on to the world, we go with the tools to build civilization wherever we are. We have equipped ourselves with knowledge, with wisdom, with wit, with courage, so that we can conquer the world, and we did. Thank you, Mother Nature helped, because because of her, we have all the different phenotypes that are now here in this room. So Africans adapted everywhere they went so they could survive, they became lighter, the hair became you know, longer and soft, so to cover the, cra the, cra the, the cranial. So all of these things just remind me that we need to know who we are. And Africa for too long has been left outside of the human experience. And we look at Africa as like a, this, either this exotic place where we can go do an adventure like Tarzan and cross the jungle, backpack in the, the Kilimanjaro and see this Maasai jumping up and down. And we're like, oh, this is Africa. I feel so good. This is like I'm reconnected. Or we see Africa as a place of chaos where there is pollution in the cities, where there's crime, where there's Ebola, where there's AIDS, where there's machete cutting. So, the narrative about Africa is really a, a narrative that needs to be carefully looked at. There is a massive deficit of image for the continent. And I believe that this deficit is costing not only the Africans, because the way we are treated by others is based on the deficit of image with a false image of what we truly are. None of the accomplishment of the Africans are really you know, put in on a pedestal like everybody else's accomplishment. How many of you here know that in Congo, we are doing mathematics 25,000 years ago? I didn't say 2,000. I said 24, 25,000 years ago. And we have the tools to show that. We have the calculator, the, 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 the a converting system between 12 and, and 10. We have the prime numbers. We have the understanding of the zero value. We doing that 25,000 years ago in Africa, in the Congo. How many of you, and I'm not asking you, Thomas, because he's been with me for five months, so of course he knows my lectures. Um, how many of you know that without Africa, we cannot have any of the device that you have in your pockets, the, the phones and the computer and all of that? And not just because of raw material, because this is what comes up, right? Oh, raw material, coltan, all the precious metals. I'm not talking about the metal, I'm talking about the tech and the, the software. To program a machine, you need a binary code. Where does the binary code come from? Again, from Africa. So Africa doesn't only have a, you know, raw material, we also have gray matter, immense, abundant knowledge. And I'm just giving this as example, but you can go into medicine, you can go into um, astronomy, you can go into the field of architecture, you can go into the field of, of physics, we can go into genetics. Today, everybody's talking about DNA, DNA, DNA. I remember people talking about DNA in Africa when I was a kid, but we call it coco. Coco is mean ancestors, but we, don't do ancestor reverence where it's like phantom floating around and we are here you know, beating on drums and all oh, the ancestors are out there. No, 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 no. We understood very well that the ancestors are right in here. And not only they record, we are, we are, we are a composite of biological information that makes us look who, like how we are, but we are also a depository of all experience of life that has come before us. So not just even human life, Every single life that has contributed to make you manifested, the information is contained in here. So we do have material, 
biological material, but we also have experiential material. And then we know how to tap into that because we have different protocols of access. But when the 15th century European comes there, the one who's burning women in his own, in his own country comes to Africa and sees a lot of things that he doesn't understand and also is motivated by a politics to say we have to subjugate these people. It's a different story. So all of this to say that I'm here and that's what I do all over the world is to talk and to challenge everyone to say, let's take another look at Africa. And why so? I mean, you are in an institution that is historical. I bet you, you all study about the story of this university and the history of this country and the history of all the great accomplishments. Why? I'm a psychologist. To build yourself a sane self-esteem, you need to know that you come from a mighty people. You need to know that you come from people who are capable because as you are a descendant of those capable people, that means that the sky is the limit. But once you know that you have not accomplished anything, that your people have only been running around naked, that it also hinders your ability to, to, to open up and to stand in the world and, be, and say, I can too, I can contribute too. So it's important to, in, to make sure that African people of, of the continent seek to know more, but not just the African people of the continent, but all the African people on the planet, all the immigrants, the African immigrants that populated this world need to know what about our continent? What about our motherland? What is it there? Because as we are now um, moving into a new era, we must say, I think we are the crossroads where the model of civilization that we have developed so far with massive industrialization, capitalism to an extreme without, you know, without limit, consume more uh, growth and the economists here, all of that is now coming to a point where it's raising a lot of question. Is it sensible? Is it smart? Because with all that model came also the, the, what, the other side, which is all the waste that we generate, all the massive chaos, the rush for resource, the pollution that we, we create by our consume, our cons excessive cons overconsumption. And yes, technology, we're looking in solution and say, the technology will help. Oh, if we have AI, AI will help. I'm like, okay, if, if, if we didn't help with our natural intelligence and we are programming this AI, I don't know if it's gonna be so, so, so efficient in solving our problems. So we still have to be around the table and we still have to make sure that we've come up with you know, sound and, and a viable solution for the problems that we are facing today. Because if we continue this way, it looks like I may be okay and I will finish my life in a world that is okay, but I cannot guarantee that for you, the youngsters. And I can certainly not guarantee that for my granddaughter, who's just turned one years old today. So my proposition is this. No, we're not putting anybody on trial, but we have to make a correct assessment and see and evaluate with honesty the model that, we, that is now the model or the operating system that we are on. And we have to update it or change it. And if we have to do so, it would be really advisable to have everybody around the table. So to bring diversity and inclusion, because that diversity will enrich our perspective. So because of that, we will be then able to make, I think, decision that may yield to a better result. Because the challenge today is not how smart we are into creating you know, cars that drive themselves or drones that fly when I, I sleep on them with fridge that fill, fill themselves up and order my food for myself. That's not gonna be the challenge for the future. The challenge for the future is going to be how capable we are to renegotiate our contract with nature. And I think Africa has a very good you know, perspective on that because sacred ecology comes from Africa. Water is sacred, forests are sacred, every life is sacred, and the rapport and the way we interact with nature is not an, an, a rapport and an interaction of abuse and, and, and just using it as an object, but understanding that just like me, 
I am nature, this is nature. So we are only partners. So that's where the challenge lies. But for that, we need to have people who have a better perspective and accept that they do not hold all the keys of solution just because they come from so-called advanced or, or developed civilization. So you two, I'm gonna leave you with these questions. When we talk about the future, Many times as an African, I hear, oh, we're gonna develop you. You're gonna be developing. You are a developing country. You are, first of all, we are not. I call ourselves recovering countries. Because when you study the history of Africa, you understand very well that we were very well developed. We had economic system, social balance. We have many things, including the, the, the charter of the human rights of the 16th century. So we, we are very, very well developed. And we have a very good balance between nature, resource management, circular economy, regenerative economy, and the life proposition. So we, were, we are recovering. But now in the process of recovering, I don't know about many, all of the Africans, but me and some other ones that I hear, and maybe some of you are saying, don't go there, don't do what we did. Because if I tomorrow, want to be like Dubai, like those big, oh, do like them, do like them. Well, I guarantee you that I'm gonna take away your ability to breathe much faster. So we cannot afford as African people to follow step and to follow suit with everyone. But we have to stop and challenge everyone to come to Africa and see how is Africa giving us a new opportunity to have a do over, knowing what we know now, Africa, which for me looks like the last buffer to human insanity, cannot be there to say, welcome home. But how do we go back home? We make of home a sanctuary. And how do we do that? Only when we work together with respect, dignity, love. Thank you. Thank you so much for that opening remark. I'd like to begin by first of all, congratulating you on your granddaughter's first birthday and happy birthday to her, wherever she is. Um, in that um, opening remark, you mentioned about the interconnectedness of all of us in the world, Africans, Europeans, Americans, everyone comes from the same source. You mentioned about how our, our shared history, uh, our descended intelligence, which we're all benefiting from today. And, that tells me that perhaps you feel as if in with issues like climate change, with the issues that are plaguing the world today, um, you know, places that are like in the southwest of England are equally as responsible and should equally play a role in, in solving it as places uh, that are in sub-Saharan Africa, as, you know, exemplified by your recent uh, visit uh, to, uh, uh, um, 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 I think, Bristol? Exeter. Oh, Exeter, Exeter, yes, yeah, Exeter, Exeter in the southwest of England. And you were supported in your work um, for plastic-free oceans. I wondered whether you think that the um, contemporary climate change debate has excluded the African continent and focused on places like the Amazon forest and rising oceans in specific and not incorporated what you spoke about, uh, about the Asian African ecology uh, solutions and, and, and so on. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. I am quite involved into, you know, many different avenues of, of, you know, development and, and I'm very concerned about the problem with the plastic. So for other issues concerning the environment, like climate change, I, I am not a scientist and I don't know enough to really, you know, make put a claim out there that it's only our human activities that are, you know, um, you know, contributing to climate change. I think we are in a planet that's always changed. However, I understand that we are indeed contributing in some ways because of our change in activities as well, and maybe we are precipitating some change that occur naturally. So I really cannot talk about that. But what I can talk about is how the consumption models that we have is is really causing massive impact in the world and I can testify that if you come to the Congo and you go into rivers that I used to bathe in when I was a child, we used to dive in with kids and everything. Today, you don't, when you look at those rivers, you don't even see the water. It's filled with plastic. But again, that's another Western proposal that came to us. I remember growing up in Kinshasa when you walked in the street and you were thirsty, you would knock at somebody's door. 
they would open and say, what can I do for you? I'm thirsty, they would bring a chair out and a cup with water and you would drink and put it down. Then they told us the consumption model, wow, you don't have to ask for water anymore. Now you can buy your own bottle. It's plastic though, and where do you dispose of it? Because we do not have the solution that comes with some of the, the modernization or the, uh, uh, the behaviors of a modern city, then we cannot handle the problem accordingly. So now we have rivers filled with plastics all over the continent and especially in Central Africa. But the problem is here again, is it an African problem? Okay, majority of this plastic is going into the ocean. But some plastic is also staying there and it's suffocating the life and the ecosystem of those rivers. But guess what? In that basin of Congo lies one third of the water, fresh, reserve, fresh water reserve of the planet. So when you are killing the water in Congo, who do you think is gonna suffer from that? Just the Congolese? Maybe at first, but when water becomes more valuable than oil, which is actually today, if I go buy a glass or a bottle of water, it might be more, more expensive than oil. What kind of problems we are preparing for ourselves if we don't take a look at our behaviors and modify those behaviors? So it doesn't suffice to say, oh yeah, let's just clean it up, let's make um, you know plastic um, building material or fuel or whatever. That's one thing. But our behaviors, our political choices, and yes, indeed, they can impact the whole ecosystem. But we need to take a look at that. And that's why I invested myself to call on to you know, academia, to call on to sci like scientists, to call on to um, entrepreneurs and say, we ought to do something because this is no, not an African problem. And that's really where my message wants to hit home. That the problems in Africa are not African problems. They are, not all, they are caused mainly by the consequences of a clash between you know, the Western world and the Arab world and the continent. So that we can go into a further elaboration of a history course, but not here. But now, even some of the choices we are making, we are making them because of the influence of others, never asking ourselves the question, what will happen next? Thank you. On the topic of burden and how the issues that we're facing ecologically in the world um, are not necessarily perhaps, um, at least the lion's share of it isn't one which is caused by Africa. Uh, many of it is caused by other nations who will have more emissions and more pollutions and so on. Some critics believe that perhaps um, the effect on nations who live in the global south, and especially like for example, um, Mangali, uh, the rising water levels, and meaning that cities are going to be awash and, and, and wiped out, is slightly unfair. So I wonder what your view is on is what what your view is on the position of critics who say that you know Africa and other countries are yet to have the industrial revolution, and so perhaps maybe they should be less um, held accountable for pollution, just like Britain, France, and America were in their own uh, economic simulation during the campaign for industrial revolution that Africa is yet to perhaps properly exemplify. Okay, I, I do understand um, this very well and I also have an opinion quite similar to those critics. So first of all, it's like the carbon credit and all of this is very nice, very smart. However, how does that work? So because I don't pollute, you pollute and you do have the money to pay for your pollution and to buy credit for me not polluting, how does that work? How does that solve the problem? I still have the question of, aren't we supposed to pollute less, period? So now, for those who would like to see an Africa, an Africa vibrant with factories everywhere, with, you know, the model, follow the model, I will answer this. Um, for me, it looks like the Western world is almost like the family, the, 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 the cousin in the family or the brother in the family that went and binge drank, binge, binge drunk, uh, binge took drugs and partied and had fun and blew all the money and everything. And now he's on the floor. So we have to look at him and say, oh, I want to do the same. No, we have to understand that we will have to have maybe come up with an alternative model because that model obviously is not paying off. So what I'm saying to people is 
I would love to find an alternative, but I also know that I cannot find an alternative without everybody else being there to seek the same alternative. So my, my, my thing is, we have to be honest. If Africa was to develop and become like China in few years, well, the problem will become ever so bigger for everyone. So how good is it if we do the same? So that's why we have to go to China. That's why we have to go to Europe. That's why we have to go to America and say, guys, I know you had a good life, you lived grand, and we may not have you know, that opportunity or maybe not the same, because we can also reframe what it means to live grand, because in the Western world, surprise, a lot of these young people here don't consider the model as being living grand. I'm a psychologist myself, and I assure you, that the most misery I've seen in families and homes has been in the Western world. The Western world is a world where, the, where your future is suicidal. We don't have the suicide problem in Africa. Yes, we have children dying because they're hungry. Yes, because we, we have children dying because they don't have the medication or they get malaria. But we don't have a future that looks itself in the mirror and say, I wanna shoot myself in the head. That's what you have here. So if your future does not even want to live, because the rate of suicide is catastrophic. What does that tell you about the society that you have generate? All the promises of capitalism to get you everything you wanted and to get you happy, because you can do everything, you can go here, there, eat as much as you want, it did not pan out to be all that, you know, fulfill all these promises, because the questions are here now. Many of the youth, now they want to go back to nature. How many do I see come to Africa with their backpack, you know, wanting to just have an experience, go, go to the villages and things like that, even thinking about creating communities that live completely different. But the Africans are still telling our leaders, no, you have to develop and develop and, de and catch up with the West and maybe one day you'll be like China, maybe one day you'll be like Dubai. That's what our leaders are still trained to believe. When your own children here know that that model is not viable because they want to go back to nature. We are there. We are already there. My villages, we don't have electricity, we don't have running water, we don't have any of these chemicals, any of that. I'm not saying that I want them to stay this way, but I'm saying I would love to build better housing, but I would love to have one of your engineers here to come there and see with the natural material, what can we do? Because yes, the, the benefit of what your, the venture or the, the adventure of the West has been, because they, are, they love novelty and they always like to go and go. I always say about my European ancestors, I say, Europeans are, are something else, man. I say, these guys, they are the guys where you tell them, you see that line over there? It's the end of the world. After that line, it's oblivion. A European will say, let's go. As if an African will be like, no, I think we, we're good, you know? So every culture, every people have the, the experience that give them an edge on how to, to, to tackle reality. But we have to be sound and honest in the way we make, we, we make an evaluation of the model. The model is not working anymore. It might have worked for a certain time, but today it's not yielding, yielding the benefit anymore. We are starting to see much more cost than benefit. So if so, the, this generation of young people, I, I am here and that's what I'm here for. I'm here to hang out with my future and tell my future, I welcome the discussion. I welcome you to come and see and talk about how we can make a difference by being more creative by being thinking outside of the box. It's our time. It's it's we are in front of you know the, we have to jump. So let's let's do it, but let's do it constructively together. Thank you. Um, in your opening remark, you talked about um, going to New York and how your fellow um, diaspora people were asking questions about Africa their misconceptions based on things they might have heard or read or seen in adverts. Um, of course, you have to sort of like let them know that, you know, it's, it's, it's not what you think on, on TV. So I wonder how recently movements such as like 
Black Lives Matter have raised the profile of not just the injustices, injustices in the world and Af in, in Africa and in America, but more positively on about the daily lives of Africans and traditions and raising the pride of black people everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I believe this has been my, my first mission really, or my first attempt uh, to, to restore some balance was to say there is a deficit and to know who I was myself and realize that the body of knowledge that my ancestors have left behind, and although some of it has been lost, uh, but m a lot of it is, is still here because we also have a different model of transmission of information that is not necessarily an intellectual transmission, but is almost like an intuitive transmission. I'm sure that there are people that are studying that in labs and one day they will say, ha ha, but we know that there is other processes to, trans to transfer information than it's written and so forth because they often qualify us as being oral culture, which is like, mm, not exactly. There's more to it than just oral culture. Um, but the fact of the matter is that because it's a time of reconnection, because now we have access to each other, it's important that African people go around the world and see how Africa has reinvented herself everywhere it went. And this is why I've been crowned in Brazil, because the aspiration of a lot of Africans of the diaspora, and just to mention, we are 400, 450 million Africa, Africans in the diaspora. So between the 450 million African in the diaspora and the 1.25 billion of Africans on the continent, that's a lump, a very big, huge amount of people that can have a massive influence on this planet. But to realize that um, these Africans want to connect home, but I also have to go and see how they have expressed themselves and to see the strength of the African people is just something that was mind boggling for me because after a journey so brutal, so despicable, so um, you know, demeaning, and after an experience of hundreds of years of, on one side, slavery and brutality and exploitation, the same on the other side because I come from Congo. I am a proud descendant of a survivor of a genocide. They killed 12 million people in Congo. So I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a descendant of a survival of a genocide. So those two experiences, and we are still here, and we have not lost our sanity. That is a testimony to the kind of culture that forged people to be so resilient and so strong physically. What was their diet that they put you three months I would, by two days in the ship, I would, I would have been dead. But you do three months, and then you go under those terrible conditions, and you still survive, and you're still able to create and be plentiful of, of things, ingenuity, and hope for the future. So it's a testimony to the type of culture we had on the continent, and that all to take, we all to take a second look and find out what were these cultures and what is the rem remnants of these cultures still today to allow us to get some strength and some resilience for as a collective from these experiences. Thank you. I want to give you a chance to talk about why you call yourself uh, uh, Queen King, yeah. female King, sorry. Um, and I wanted to ask it in, in the context of this question, um, Africa has seen a long line of different political, militaristic, economic, strong men who have led the country. And um, to some degree, people might disagree and agree on what they've achieved. I wonder whether you think it's been success successful so far and do you think this is sustainable? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to be as brief as possible because I know that we are running uh, out of time. But um, female king is why. It's not we don't have a problem of equality with men and women because in our cosmogony, men and women are initially the same being and then split to experience itself in a different way. So men and women are complementary and when they are together, they form the perfect being. But the attributes are a bit different than in the Western world. Women represent power. That's women. 
Why? Because we give birth, we give life, we, we, we are the channel through which creation comes through that energy, that very potent energy. But men, they represent authority. So the throne is the symbol of power. So the throne is a female entity. And it can be a chair, but it's not really the chair. It's, the, it's that energy, that the throne. So it's only normal that you sit a man on the throne because the man on the throne and the woman who is the feminine energy is just bringing the two together. Because when you have power without authority, your power basically cannot be manifested in reality. But when you have authority, when it's not seated on power, then this is where you have abuse and you have you know, coercion and you have a you know, forceful way to put things forward for the community. So the balance between the two is extremely important. So the fact that I'm a female and I'm seated on the throne is kind of like a little bit of an awkward thing because it's a female, the power, and then I'm a female, I sit again, so it's power, power. So to do, to not do that, that's why I'm a female king because then I was transformed into a male energy to many rituals and, and very sacred proceedings so that I could emulate or I can embody the male energy so I can sit on the throne. It happens sometimes, not all the time, but for us, a man on the throne, it doesn't mean that a man is more powerful. So maybe when you talk about these leaders in Africa for the past history, we inherited a model that really is not ours. Even the problem of men and women today in Africa is really something that came with the Western model where w women for centuries didn't even have a soul. Actually, thousands of years during the Greek, women were objects. So we inherit now a, a template that come to superimpose itself on the existing structures. And now, of course, we're going to act it out. But is it to the benefit of the continent? I don't think so. I think that the more the continent will re connect with its true identity and would allow its, it, the history and the past and the teaching of our forefathers to come back into the midst of us, then wisdom will be the motor and the engine to, to, to propulse Africa towards the direction of, of the Mahat of, of, of balance. So I, I really believe that more women will, will, will be restored into their position of power than the authority of the man will be fueled so that it can manifest into a balanced society. Thank you. I'd like to quickly open up the floor for questions. I'm very wary that we have, have not many times, so maybe one or two questions. Does anyone have any questions you'd like to ask? Sure, I recognize the lady in the black jacket. A mic will be brought to you. So you talked about the importance of knowing about the, the capability of one's ancestors as a source of self-esteem. Um, and it got me thinking about how I think African-American history often really begins with enslavement as opposed to beginning with sort of the cultural richness that existed before. Um, and so I'm wondering what you think the role of African history before sort of colonial contact ought to be in what African-American students are taught in school? Yeah, well, I, I raised my children in America and uh, they had, uh, my son, I remember they had world civilization. And uh, so he was every single continent. And when he came to Africa, he was two pages. <laughs> so when you look at yourself and, and you are absent, you know, from the narrative, of course it does leave you know, something in you. It does, you know, alter your ability to project yourself even into a future, to dream yourself into, you know, something. So that's psychology. That's plain and simple. That's why we spend our time studying history, so that we can keep on building ourselves. And when you know you're building yourself on the shoulders of those who have come before you, your height is different. The way your vision is, that you can project your vision, is way different than if you are all the way in the bottom on the floor. So I think that to, to talk about the history of Africa is going to be, of course, essential element to restore some sense of dignity to many Africans and to tell the children, you know your ancestors were doing mathematics 25,000 years ago, so you know what? Mathematics is no big deal for you. It's a completely different thing than to tell him, you know your ancestor, two years ago, you were still swinging from a tree. Now go do a complex math problem. And it's not that I'm, I'm caricaturing, but this is basically the, 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 what I'm trying to say. But also, it's imperative that the world also reclaim 
that heritage like its own. So African history is not African story. African history is the story of humanity. So it has to be included because we too, all of us are missing, are missing an arm if you don't talk about Africa. So we too could use you know, the tool, that tool to enhance our ability to forecast ourselves and project ourselves in the future. Thank you. I'm sorry, that's all we have time for today. Um, thank you very much, Your Majesty. It's been a complete pleasure hosting you here today. Could you all uh, join me in thanking the Majesty for this today?